Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. Great to have you here. My name is James, and I am a kidney warrior. I was diagnosed with stage five kidney failure, and my doctors got my blood pressure under control, got me set up with a great diet. I stopped doing all the things that were bad for me. And over time, my health started to improve. And a key part of that is what we're gonna be talking about tonight, getting my blood pressure under control. Now to talk about all that, and we've got a lot to talk about, so I'm gonna get moving right into our conversation tonight. We've got with us the author of what I I tell you guys, this is the best book for anyone diagnosed with kidney disease. The book is called Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease by Dr. Stephen Rosansky. This book makes understanding kidney disease, what you need to look for, when you need to worry, what you can do. It makes all of that easy to understand. And it really helps get rid of a lot of those worries and fears that you have when you're first diagnosed. So let's welcome here to talk about managing your blood pressure, which in the long term can help lower your creatinine, help save your kidneys, and help you live longer. Please welcome Dr. Steven Rosansky. Hey, Doc. Hey, James. <clears throat> Always good to see you. Always good to be on your show. And I guess you want me to introduce myself as I Normally yeah, in case do. there's new people here and they're like, who is this guy? Is he selling some of that fake woo-woo stuff? Or is this someone I really should listen to? Yeah, well, I don't have any woo-woo to sell you. But I will tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a retired kidney specialist. Uh, I do still see patients. I actually saw patients today in the free clinic. One of them I'll mention, not by name, of course. Um, and uh, I have... Um, done a lot of clinical work. I've taken care of kidney patients for over 40 years. Um, I have also done a good bit of research on progression of kidney disease and the issue of when uh, the best time to start dialysis, which was one of the motives to, uh, to write the book because people are starting dialysis way too early. And my work, my research has been recognized uh, as one of my research studies with my colleagues was voted the number one game changer in the field. And basically we showed that starting dialysis early may be harmful. So anybody who is close to that, I highly recommend you read my book and certainly the section on uh, the best time to start dialysis. And uh, tonight we're going to give you the most updated information on blood pressure, which is been a moving target for those of you who've had high blood pressure for a long time. You know that uh, gold blood pressure has changed a lot you know, over the years. And uh, we'll get right into it, James, if that's okay with you. Hey, that sounds good. And for everyone out there, um, if you are new, Dr. Rosansky always sets aside some time to, at, to answer your questions. So go ahead, introduce yourself, type your questions in the comment and we'll try to get to them either during the show or during the Q&A section at the end. Okay, let's just start from the really basics. So you know when you go to your blood pressure, get your blood pressure measured, most of you I hope are measuring it yourselves at home. You have a top number, which is the systolic blood pressure, and the bottom number, which is what, James? I'm gonna keep quizzing. Diastolic. Attaboy, right? great. Okay, normal is less than 120 over 80. Elevated is? 120 to 129 elevated blood pressure over 80. Stage one blood pressure, which is really kind of crazy, is 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And uh, it used to be over 140, so we've moved it down 10 points. So who needs to be treated over if they're over 130? I would say if you've got CKD, that means you're at risk for hardening of the arteries and having the complications of hardening of the arteries. And so in general, if you do not have a, a risk factor, you don't have any uh, hardening of the arteries, you haven't had a heart attack or a stroke or anything uh, like that, chest pain, angina, they, they would, your doctor would first try conservative management. But if you've already got some risk factor, like uh, you've got 
CKD, then I would recommend if it's over 130 that you get treated. And over 140, over 90 is considered stage two, which is interesting. Over 140, over 90 used to be basic high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So why should anybody worry about their blood pressure? Why do we need to get this treated? There's a couple of reasons. Number one, for you folks with kidney disease, it's going to lower your risk of getting a complication of hardening of the arteries, which most of you probably have stage three kidney disease and, and your risk is not for dialysis or for needing a kidney transplant. It, it is with, with stage three kidney disease, especially if you have a good bit of protein in the urine, your risk of getting one of those complications is high. So you can reduce that risk considerably uh, by getting your blood pressure down. And we've got some good research on just how much you can improve the situation, how much you can get, uh, how much benefits you can get just by dropping your blood pressure, let's say from 145 to 135, 10 points, you can decrease your, your, your chances of, of uh, having heart failure by a third of get having a stroke by about a third and by uh, having trouble with the arteries to your heart by about 20%. So there's good evidence that even 10, 10 points and even five, uh, five points on your blood pressure, your top number, every five points you get your blood pressure down, you're going to reduce your risk of one of those bad outcomes. So this is real serious stuff. You can really save your life, potentially save yourself from a fatal heart attack or stroke uh, or having a death from a heart related issue. The first thing before we get into how to treat it is how do you measure it? Now, most people are not familiar with the best way to measure it. The best way to measure it is sitting with your back supported and your legs on the floor. And you should be relaxed for a few minutes. And uh, if you don't take it right, you could get at least 10 millimeters high. You can also get a high reading if you don't have the right size cuff. I'm going to tell you about a patient I saw today who was really sharp. The cuff should wrap around at least one and a quarter time, not just once. If it's wrapping around once, it's not going to give you an accurate reading. I would have you wait five minutes, relax. When you get into the doctor's office, just rest for a few minutes or when you're at home and, and get at least two readings to get an idea of what, the, what, your, what your real number is. The most important blood pressure is which one? Doctor's office or your home blood pressure, James? Home blood pressure. You got it. You got when, it. When Walk. I go to the doctor, I'm worried because I see that scale sitting over there. No, I got to hop on it. Yeah. Well, there's more to it than that, but, but you're <laughs> right. And you should rely more on your home blood pressures, especially if you take it at various times of the day. And even if you take it at work to know you know, blood pressure is a 24 hour thing. It's not just one reading. So get yourself a home blood pressure monitor. They cost maybe 30 bucks and you don't have to have a stethoscope. It'll automatically give you your blood pressure. Very important. And we're going to talk about a couple of uh, ways that your blood pressure can give you false readings. When should you check your blood pressure? James, when do you think is the best time to check blood pressure? Just before it's time for you to take your medication. Good. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's when I take mine. Yeah. And, and, and why, why do you do that? Just in case it's too low, I don't need yeah. to take medication and make it go lower. Cause that could be a problem. Right. And I don't need you to check your blood pressure every day and, and people can get obsessed with it. And that can actually raise your blood pressure by worrying so much about it. But you certainly want to check it. If you're feeling dizzy, weak, especially when you stand up fast check it. And if it's running before your dose, like around a hundred top number, probably reasonable to hold the dose until the next dose, make sure it's back up there to, you know, the, the 130 range, 120 to 130 range, which should be around where you are all the time. And if you drop it too low, what can happen, James? Well, you could pass out. You could right. hurt your kidneys because they, they oh. need the blood pressure to be in a certain range to work right. Right. And I'm sure they, there's other problems. They can affect your heart. You can get decreased flow to your heart. You can potentially even have a heart attack. You can get decreased blood flow to your brain. It could, it could produce a stroke. I've seen so many patients in the hospital, believe it or not, that have had over treatment of blood pressure on occasion. 
and have had bad outcomes. So be sure if you're feeling not feeling right to check your blood pressure. Now, James, you know about white coat. Tell everybody what white coat is. White when you coat, go to the doctor's office, you see those white coats and your blood pressure starts going up. So that's, okay. that's why, and I had the white coat and the scale syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I hate that scale. And, and what's, what's the, what's the problem with this white coat deal? What, what can happen? Your blood pressure increases. You get a little nervous. You're worried and boom, blood pressure is going up. Now you're getting a false reading and you may get too much medication prescribed because your readings higher artificially. Perfect. Perfect. That's exactly right. Um, and, but here's I've something. I've been listening. Blood pressure is important. Okay. Well, you're right on, but I got something that you haven't heard of. Have you heard of mask hypertension? No. <laughs> okay. There's always yeah. something new to learn here. <laughs> Some people actually feel better in the doctor's office and their blood pressure is higher at home. And this is amazing. There was a study done over a bunch of years and they, they checked this, this issue and they found out anywhere between 10 or 20% of people before they start treatment have this issue where the blood pressure is higher at home than in the doctor's office. And get this, more than half of people that they followed had higher blood pressure. Once they were on treatment, their blood pressure was higher at home than in the doctor's office. I mean, it stands to reason because in a doctor's office, hopefully, you know, unless you're really afraid of your doctor, you're going to you know, be more relaxed. You're not doing your normal thing. You're not, mm -hmm. hopefully not worrying about, you know, getting to work and worrying, dealing with your kids. So, it, so that's why it's good to take blood pressures at home at varying times to make sure that you don't have one of these issues. Uh, another thing that we've had questions about before is what if your bottom, the main number that we treat with blood pressure is the top number, systolic. What if your bottom number is high? What's a high bottom number, James? You know, a high bottom number. 90 is high. At least that's what it used to be. And that's what I think it still is. Okay. Well, the current thinking is 95. If it's running consistently over 95, you treat it regardless of what the top number is. So if it's running 95 to 100, but it's 120 consistently over 100, or you know, it, that needs to be treated. Now, what about lowering the bottom number? A lot of people will get their blood pressure checked and the bottom number will be low. How low can it go and should you worry about it and why? Yeah, and someone just asked that question. Theirs is a 48. Okay, well, the first of all, you, you, you need to understand that it's possible that you're getting a false reading. But if you get a, a good blood pressure check with a good machine and your doctor's getting it, um, and it's, here's the deal. If you are over age 60, there was a study done, a large study, uh, that found that people who have blood pressures on the bottom number of the diastolic that are below 60 and they're over 60 years of age, they got complications of not getting enough blood to the arteries of the heart. Mm -hmm. They could get heart attacks. They could get coronary artery problems. What, what, so what is systole? You know what, what happens during systole to your heart? No. The heart contracts. Systole is the contraction. Diastole is the relaxation phase. Mm -hmm. When the heart relaxes, the blood is going to those arteries in your heart. So if you, um, if you have a blood pressure that's like 50 uh, and you're over 60 and your doctor needs to do this, I mean, you know, if someone has that particular problem, you, you discuss it with your doctor and you could say you heard this on dad advice that if you're over 60 and you're running under 60 on that bottom number, maybe we need to cut the medicine. Okay. So that's going to be not, not a lot of people, but some people. But you want to confirm that with your doctor, okay? Over 60 and under 60 on the bottom number, that's a little bit of a concern. What about symptoms of high blood pressure? Do people with high blood pressure get symptoms? So I, I'm going to guess that you may get like a headache or something like that, but you could be walking around and not realize you really can't feel it. Your second answer, I think, would be right on 
it is just like kidney disease. It is a silent killer, just like CKD, chronic kidney disease can be. And the people that have symptoms are, are people whose blood pressure shoots up relatively quickly in a blood pressure crisis. And they can get confused. They can get headaches. They can really be, they can even have vomiting and seizures if it's really bad. When, but when some my, people, go when ahead. my kidneys were at their worst, my blood pressure was crazy. That top number was over 200. The bottom number was well over 100. And my vision was blurry. And it took a long time after they got my blood pressure under control before my vision got back to normal. And it took weeks to kind of get back to that. Well, so that's something without getting a lot of terms called hypertensive encephalopathy. In other words, it affects the brain. And, and if you get real high blood pressures going up fairly quickly, you can get everything that you're describing, James. But there are, on the other hand, there are lots of people walking around with 200 top number. 200 in the, just like you without symptoms because they're walking around with it for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing to remember, as we just talked about low blood pressure can give you symptoms and be aware if you're getting weak or dizzy, check your blood pressure. Don't overtreat. I can't tell you how many patients I've seen, even friends and relatives that have overtreated, including myself. I have at times overtreated my own blood pressure. So if you're symptomatic, have that home blood pressure monitor and make sure you check it. And what goal blood pressure should we be shooting for? What do you think, James? What would 120 be over 80 or better. Perfect. But try to keep it in the 120 to 130 range. And that's, and we're going to discuss the most recent research that proved that you should not be going for 140, which used to be the old goal, mm -hmm. but you should be looking at 120 to 130. Unless you're an older patient, it's very frail, uh, and those folks may, it may be too dangerous. But for, for you folks with kidney disease, I think if you're over 130, over 80, you definitely should be treated, and it should be your home blood pressure. And you're treating it to slow your decline of kidney function, slow the elevation of your creatinine, and prevent those bad outcomes from hardening of the arteries, the strokes, and the heart attacks. And that study that I just mentioned, that came, came across with this aggressive treatment. So they had two groups. One, they got the blood pressure down to 120, the other one 130, and there was a major difference in the bad outcomes. So that's why they showed, uh, but it was not diabetics. So if you're diabetic and you look at, you know, what the guidelines show for diabetics, not quite as aggressive, okay? Instead of, you know, 120, the goal may be 125, but, I would say it depends upon your age and how, how often you're able to monitor your own blood pressure. But there's no free lunch because with this attempt to get everybody down to a, like a 120 and even in some cases 110, you're going to get the low blood pressure. You're going to get people even passing out and you're going to get some people that will have a decline of their kidney function. So you've got to keep an eye on it. Uh, and make sure that once you're on a stable dose, that your blood pressure is, you know, in a good range. So, uh, and, and you want to make sure you monitor if you're feeling symptomatic, you're not feeling right. My advice, if you're a young kidney patient, especially one with protein in the urine, especially one that's showing some changes in your uh, kidney function, your creatinine is going up, your EGFR is going down, I would aim for 110 to 120. And... I try to do that for myself. I think that low the better in general, uh, as long as you keep your eye on it. So the main thing we want to spend some time on tonight is the drugs to use. And James and I were just talking about the, the drugs that he's on. It's and a long list. Yeah, he, he's on a really long list. And James has something interesting that we're also going to mention that a lot of you probably have never heard of. Um, so if you're over 160, it is highly unlikely that you're going to get control of less than two drugs. And James is on how many drugs for your blood pressure? Four, oh my five. goodness. <laughs> Let me count them. Give me that. Okay. So I take a morning dose and an evening dose. So let's see. That's one, two. That one's something else. Three, four, five, six, I seven, think you're on. plus the, uh, the aspirin. But you're not on blood. I think you're on four. Anyway, I think I think he's on roughly four. But 
And, yeah, and, yeah, I don't know what all these do. I know one of them's for uric acid. Right, right. Like you're on, I think, four <laughs> that I better. A giant them. list of them all day long. <laughs> and, and here's something that anybody, everyone listening, uh, we, we, we had a really good discussion, last two discussions related to protein in the urine. And, and I, I highly suggest that anyone who's on tonight's show, listen to those if you haven't listened to it. But if you're one of the, anybody with high blood pressure needs to get your protein in the urine checked and it's, and it's not 24 hour urine and it's, uh, it's basically your doctor will send to the lab, a tiny specimen of urine. The lab will measure what they call albumin in your urine and the creatinine level and taking those two, the albumin to creatinine level tells you how much protein you're spilling in 24 hours. And James knows that you can collect your urine for 24 hours, but that's a pain. And, and, and especially if you keep it in the fridge at work, people are not going to be too happy because they may think yeah. it's <laughs> and that could create some problems. Um, so, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on proteinuria again. Listen to those two talks, the last two that we did, that James and I did. But there are things that can give you false positive. If you have a urinary tract infection, uh, if you've had extreme exercise, uh, they can give you false positive. If you have a elevated albumin creatinine ratio and your doctor can measure and tell you, you should absolutely be on an ACE or an R. If you're not having, which actually James does not have, which he just told me tonight, that protein in the urine problem, not as critical. You don't have to be on it. I think they're good drugs in general for the heart as well. But for the kidney issue, if you're not having protein in the urine, you mainly want to get to that goal of shooting for around 120. Um, now, uh, when to use an ACE and when to use an R. Do you know, James, when would you think your your listeners should be on an ACE? First of all, well, we'll get into some names in, in a little bit. You but, had mentioned it in a previous one, not to take them together, it's one or the other, and I cannot remember when when to go with which. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just kind of tell you real quickly about a patient I saw in the free clinic today who is a large fellow, really large fellow, and we had uh, problems. So the first blood pressure was 210 over 110. The next blood pressure was 138 over 80 something. And I go, hmm, something's weird here. So I had the nurse recheck it. So she checked it with the stethoscope and everything. And anyway, long and the short of it is that this patient was a smart patient. He's been checking his blood pressure at home. He knew to get the right size cuff to get the blood pressure at home. I checked it myself and I got what he was getting at home, which happened to be around 160, okay? And I did my own way of figuring it out. But get your blood pressure measured at home, get a little machine and get the right size cuff, it's critical. And he actually had the problem. He And he's got protein in the urine. He's got a lot, first time I saw him today, he's got a lot of protein in the urine. And so I wanted to be sure that he was on the right drug. So he said he was on enalapril. And I wasn't thinking, right, enalapril, is that an ACE or an A? Uh, P-R-I-L. Those are ACEs, right? Hey, James. Yes. Okay. And it's 50-50 chance, so. <laughs> okay. And the, and the ones that, so he was on enalapril, and he said, that he had this cough. He oh, kept yeah. coughing. And, I, and I'm thinking to myself that it was an arm. I wasn't thinking straight. You shouldn't have a cough. You get a cough with the prills, with the prills, with the prills, okay? With the ACEs, you get the cough. And you can also get swelling of your lips and, and, you know, and, and your mouth and tongue in the severe cases. But the cough is typical, very common, especially more common in African-American patients, which you happen to be. Um, and for sure, you need to be on an ARB, ends in tan, okay? 
And um, you can use these drugs. They're so important to slow the decline of your kidney function, to slow the rise of your creatinine. They're so important. You can even use them up to stage four and five CKD, even with your EGFR less than 30, even less than 15. Uh, even if your blood pressure is normal and you've got, this is very critical, even with a normal blood pressure and you have consistently on your urine protein check, one plus or more, you should be on an ACE or an ARB. And I'll tell you, James, the drugs have become so cheap because they're all mm -hmm. generic these days. And so I personally just move right to the ARB so I don't even have to worry about the cough and the swelling and the angioedema, the drugs that end in TAN. Now, another key issue, which we discuss a lot in our two prior talks on proteinuria, is not only to be on an ACE and R, but what, what was the key point about the dosing of the ACE or R? It was the max dose you could tolerate. Perfect. Yes. Excellent, James. You're listening. I like it. <laughs> hey, I got to take care of my kidneys. <laughs> if you have consistently one plus or more on urine protein, you consistently have two to 300 or more on that ratio of albumin and creatinine. And if you're outside the US, it's 20 or more, okay? Because we use different units. Maximum dose, I would push the ARB. If you're on an ACE, it's okay. You're tolerating it, that's fine. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples real quick. And James posted it on that proteinuria uh, talk, I think. Mm -hmm. yep. I gave you some of the names of the drugs. Because we, we had something called Game Changer Drugs and it was a lot of drugs in that particular talk. And you so, gave me the maximum dosage. Exactly. Just they're going to give you a few. A lot of you may be on something called um, Irbisartan uh, or Abapro. Well, the, the biggest, most popular one is the Merck drug, Losartan. Losartan, very popular drug, Ocozar. 100. If you've got protein in the urine, you should be on 100, no less. Um, I can run down. Ibrisartan is 300, Candisartan is 32, Valsartan is 320. If you happen to be on Lysinopril, it's 40, Enalapril, it's 40, Venazapril, it's 80. Don't, I don't see any need to take the first of the prills. If you happen to know what the name of the first prill is, the first ACE drug, people are still on it. It's a three times a day drug. I don't and use that prill. It's Captopril. Captopril. Oh, Captopril. I recognize that. That was the first one, and I did studies on it. It was the first one. We started out doing it in diabetics. Um, and and uh, you should make your lives easy. There's no need to be on more than twice a day dosing. The three times a day drugs is absolutely unnecessary. Here's a big issue, which is really critical, especially for those of you that are on ACE or ARBs. A lot of folks get the drug stopped. And from the research information on how this is going with your, you folks out there, less than half of you with kidney disease are taking these ACEs and ARBs or ARBs. Half of you with the urine protein, again, consistently over one plus, less than half of you are taking it. And those of who are taking it are not getting the max dose. You need to get the max dose. So here's what happens. Why are so many people getting their drug stopped? And what do we do about it? No clue. Yeah, you do. You know, what happens in a lot of cases when you start an ACE or an R? What happens? Oh. So I just started an ACE about two months ago, and my nephrologist was telling me about it, though I, I knew about it. I would, she expected to see a drop in my EGFR. And we, we did based on the labs. It was a very small drop and then it held steady and she was good with that. Okay. So there are two things that are really common that can cause a, a what they call acute drop or AKI in your EGFR, a rise in your creatinine. Rise in creatinine, drop in EGFR. 
commonest things are which two common the most common things that cause it? I cannot remember. Dehydration number oh, one. Yes. Right? Commonest and low blood low blood pressure, number two. So if you get started on, on one of these drugs and your EGFR goes down some and your creatinine goes up, but you're not dehydrated. You got to make sure you correct the correctable, get hydrated mm -hmm. first. That could be the problem. And, and you haven't had an overly large drop in your blood pressure. You didn't go down to 90 or hundred, you know, from 160. If your blood pressure's in range and you're not dehydrated, you can have a 30% decline. This is what all the kidney specialists got together and we've agreed on. Your EGFR can decrease by a third. And, and they still recommend that you stay on the drugs. Really important. Discuss it with your doctor if that happened. Um, what's the other reason? What do these drugs do to your potassium? Oh, increase your potassium. Exactly, exactly. And there are other drugs that can increase your potassium we're going to get to in a minute. And James happens to be on one of those drugs called, you know what the name of it is? I do not know, but I know one of them is a potassium. It helps me hold on to potassium. Right. It's your aldactone or spironolactone. Ah. So if you combine that with an ACE, you can get a big increase in your potassium. Now, kidney doctors are used to potassium going up some. Most GPs will panic. The potassium goes up over five, they panic. If kidney doctors like myself, 5.5, we're fine with that. If your potassium is 5.5, stay on the ACE or ARB. Even if your EGFR drops by a third, you could stay on it. Now, if it drops more, then it's time to stop. But discuss that with your doctor because this could be the thing that will keep you off dialysis. It is critical if you've got that protein in the urine. And they've actually determined the bad results from so many people stopping these drugs. They actually followed these people who stopped the drug. If you do, they, they followed them for five years. You are much more likely to go on dialysis or die. So these drugs are important for those of you, especially that have increased protein in the urine. Okay. And as James said, very nicely, one or the other or ace or an r but not both and i when, when they first came out i i had these people with high protein in the urine and i said well i'm going to just give them both but the study found that if you give both you're increasing the risk of getting what james can you figure out if you gave two you gave an ace and an r what may happen i i do not know you get acute renal you can get more oh. acute renal failure in other words Oh, we don't want that. Yeah. So, I mean, and a, anyway, I'm not going to get into any more detail on it, but generally speaking, and, and the recommendation is not to do an ACE and an R. Uh, and, um, and we already talked about when you use an ARB, right? You have to use an ARB if you got the cough and uh, you get the swelling and welts around your eyes and your lips for sure. No. Ace, no prill, use the ARB, okay? And, and the ARBs are about the same price, so I would, I would be on an ARB, the drugs that end, this is the generic name, not the brand name, and T-A-N. Look up your name of your drugs online, whatever drug you ha have, look up the, the generic name. If it's an ending in T-A-N, it's a ARB, and if it's end in P-R-I-L, it's an ACE. The ACEs are the ones that can give you the call. Now I'm going to touch on a really important new issue that James and I were just talking about. And James is one of these folks, I'm convinced, that may have something called hyperaldosterone, big word, okay? What is that hormone, what is that aldosterone it's produced by your adrenal gland, right? Gland in your body, oh, right over the kidneys. The adrenal glands are right over the kidneys. What does that aldosterone do? 
I have kid, no clue. You just told me, you, you know. What does it do to potassium? Oh, is it, it increases it? Or is that what makes it go down? Because mine's low. It goes down. The ah. aldosterone, right? Gets the kidney to get more sodium back in your blood, right? And more potassium out in your urine. Uh, yeah, because I when I was first diagnosed, my potassium, I still remember it. It said critically low on my first labs. And they were giving it to me in IV bags. To that get it up. is tip off that you and these and some of you there's going to be a good number of you folks out there that have this and your doctors have not clued you in they don't know about it it could be somebody with resistant blood pressure like james when they measure your potassium it's low even when you have an elevated creatinine okay you may have one of these situations where that particular adrenal gland is producing more of that aldosterone and it increases the sodium, which gets your blood pressure up and gets rid of the potassium. And it can be checked by getting a blood level of that aldosterone. As long as you're not already on the drug that James on correctly, which is aldactone or spironolactone. <clears throat> and <clears throat> James, I don't know if you remember our last talk, we were talking about some of these, and I, and I hope some of you folks would go listen to that one, the Game Changer Drugs. Yes, the SGLT2s or something like that. All right, that's one of the big ones. But, there's, but the other one I mentioned are these types of drugs, these aldosterone blockers, right? Aha. They can... And there's more research being done all the time on them. They can not only get that blood pressure under control for those of you who happen to have this problem with low potassium, tough to control blood pressure, but they may also have a side effect of slowing the decline of your kidney function, slowing how quickly your creatinine is going to go up. The other drugs in that category besides aldactone, which is the brand name for spironolactone, is a plerinone. And then there's a new one, which I'm not going to mention, which is extremely expensive. The new one is, is what the study was done on. And, and that's yeah. just it. You got a drug, you're going to invest the money in doing these studies are very expensive to do. And, and, and next time we're going, anyway, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. It's any, any good study takes a lot of time and takes a lot of money to do. <clears throat> now let's get into some of the other drugs uh, that a lot of you are taking and which are fine. There's a drug called amlodipine, and it's widely used. It's a good drug. I use it a lot in my patients. It's something called a calcium channel blocker. I'm not going to get into, you know, what that means. Uh, but anyway, amlodipine and uh, these drugs and diltiazem is another one. Uh, they're especially good in the African-American population that tend to have a sensitivity to salt. African-Americans can get a big increase in blood pressure by having a lot of salt in their diet. And they can get a big decrease in the blood pressure by cutting down that salt. Um, and in some cases, they may not get as good a result with an ACE or an R. So, um, but again, protein in the urine for sure, one of them, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, one little side effect, I don't know if anybody listening or tonight or may listen in the future, if you're on amlodipine, if you're a female that just happens to be a higher incidence of getting some swelling in your legs. Uh, and if you get that problem with amlodipine, if you happen to be on it, you get some swelling in your legs, you want to take a drug that has got the same kind of effect, diltiazem, good, good substitute for amlodipine. Diltiazem. A lot of you folks are taking NSAIDs like ibuprofen, you know, the things for your arthritis. Uh, if you've got CKD, you don't want to be on high doses of these for a long time. They're okay to use short term uh, if, you know, for your arthritis. Um, now, it turns out that 
NSAIDs, what do you think NSAIDs do to blood pressure? I'm going to, well, they thin the blood, don't they? Yeah. So yeah, does that increase it? That, 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 uh, will, that will increase your tendency to, to bleed. That's, that's what they can oh, okay. do. They increase your bleeding tendency by affecting uh, platelets. But um, they raise blood pressure. NSAIDs can raise your blood pressure. Uh, and they can wipe out your blood pressure control. Here's an here's a, here's a interesting trick. If you take an NSAIDs and you need to take them, you know, short term, hopefully, but some of you may be taking them longer term, calcium channel blockers will work and, and even with the NSAIDs. So those are a good combination with your NSAIDs, a calcium channel blocker like amlodipine, as someone uh, put up Procardi, which is another calcium channel blocker. Diltiazem is another one. Okay. These are the calcium channel blockers. Um, what about water pills? Should you be on a water pill if you got high blood pressure? And which one? I'm going to say yes, and I don't know which one, but I'm guessing, I'm pretty sure I'm on a water pill. Well, I would say that all of you who have high blood pressure should be on a water pill with your other blood pressure medicine. They will work better. Now, some of you are on the wrong water pill, like the patient I saw today was on furosemide or Lasix. Some other people are on Bumix. Not the best drug for blood pressure. Even with low, and we used to think that you can't use something called a thiazide if your kidney functions below 20. But even up to 20, you can use a thiazide direct, hydrochlorothiazide. I put a lot of my patients on that. I think you're on that, James. Yep, I'm on that one. I got my what? list here of all my pills. Perfect, perfect. And here's a here's something that you guys should take and girls take home. Clothalidone or hygrotin is a great water pill. <clears throat> and it's especially good because it'll get that potassium down for those of you who get the potassium going up with an ACE or an ARB, which of course is not James' problem, he's got the opposite problem. But if you happen to be one, which is most people, most people get some bump up of their potassium when they go on an ACE or an ARB. Hygrodin or clothalidone will get that potassium out. Uh, and it's probably better than hydrochlorothiazide, but either one are probably okay. Now, I actually had a patient and this is, uh, I'm not going to give you the whole story, but you can get a large drop in potassium on rare occasions. It's probably people that have that thing we just talked about where that aldosterone is too high. Mm -hmm. uh, they get real low potassium. And too low potassium can stop your breathing. You can become paralyzed. You should get it checked after you start any water pill. Your doctor should check the potassium. A um, couple of other drugs. I want to leave a little time for questions. Um, there's the drugs called beta blockers that James is on, which one you're on the metropolol, low pressure. I think you're on that beta block. If oh, something, the metropolol, whatever. Yeah. yeah the e extended yeah. release yeah. 300 milligrams. Yep. The, the drugs that end in OL, metropolol, propranolol, corbetolol. Again, again, these are generic names. These are beta blockers. Slow the heart rate, especially good for those of you who have a common condition called atrial fibrillation. Real good drug for your blood pressure and to slow your heart. Other drugs that can slow your heart, if you happen to have fast heart rate, especially with fibrillation, atrial fibrillation, diltiazem and verapamil. Real good drugs. Um, now, James is on clonidine, which is a powerful blood pressure drug. Yeah, that's it's the one that I only take at night because it knocks me out. I actually love it because it knocks me out. I take it 45 minutes later, I it's a struggle to stay awake. And I, that's exactly what I recommend. If you're on it once a day at night is the way, and it's strong. It, if you're having, your doctor's having drug blood pressure control problems with you, say, hey, doc, can you try me on clonidine? And there's also a patch that you can use on the clonidine. Uh, but it, it also produces dry mouth, uh, but it's powerful. And the other drug for men who have trouble with stream, weak stream, a, a good drug is called terazosin and prazosin. Those, those drugs can help you 
void. So there's certain drugs that are good for certain situations. And the most powerful drug, if your blood pressure is not being controlled, ask your doctor about minoxidil. It has basically revolutionized, rev made treating blood pressure that everybody, just about anyone can be controlled. And that's the most powerful drug, minoxidil. A similar drug is hydralazine, but that's a much weaker drug. These drugs, if you're using either one of these, your doctor needs to use it correctly. And I saw someone today that was not being used correctly. It needs to be used with both a beta blocker, like one of those proles, you know, metoprolol, propranolol, mm -hmm. and a water pill, because otherwise they're not going to work. And um, best time to dose your drugs, I think, water pills in the morning, so you don't pee all night. Other blood pressure medicines, I think the evening may be the best time uh, to dose them. And um, if your blood pressure is not controlled, some of the reasons why, what are some of the reasons why you folks out there can't get the blood pressure under control? What are some of the common reasons, James? Would it be too much kidney damage? Is that... Well, that's, I, I'm telling you, even with severe kidney failure and the worst blood pressure can be controlled if your doctor knows what to do. Clonidine, minoxidil, it'll get it under control. It's too much salt, especially in the oh. African American population. Uh, not taking your water pills. You need to take the water pills. Not taking your meds, <laughs> which is one of the commonest reasons. People just aren't taking their meds. Drinking a bunch of booze will get that blood pressure high and it won't be coming down. A lot of folks are taking Adderall, Ritalin for ADD, that can get the blood pressure up high. And sometimes they're taking it recreation drugs like cocaine. And, and I've seen many, many people, uncontrolled blood pressure taking those Ritalin, Adderall, cocaine, street drugs. Uh, and a lot of you folks are on a complicated regimen, which again, once a day, most twice a day. I try to get my pay, folks on once a day dosing if I can. Twice a day is the max that you should be taking your blood pressure pills. The last thing I'm going to mention is what about potassium? And this is, we're going to, the next talk, I'm going to talk about diet. James, I think you've convinced me to go on, talk more about diet. There's always it's, so many questions about diet. Yeah, especially you want to clear up this whole low protein stuff. Uh, potassium, a diet high in potassium and low in sodium is the best for your blood pressure, especially for the African-American population that's all sen sensitive. The foods that are high in potassium are plant-based, right? Plant-based diet, high in potassium, low in sodium. That kind of diet will be best for your blood pressure and best for slowing decline of kidney function. And we'll get into that next time because we want to have a few minutes for questions. So James, you got any questions first? Or you All right. So let's give everyone a moment, type in your questions and we'll go and look at what's in there. But I'll tell you, doc, going through my list of medications, I think I have all my bases covered. You know, I take a lot. I feel like I take a lot of pills, but you're always like, you take one from this category, this one, this one. It's like, yep, I got that. I got that. I got that. And I think I think getting my blood pressure under control played a huge, huge role in my recovery from my drop in kidney function that sent me to the ICU and has helped me to main, maintain stability in my life. And, you know, I got my diet under control, got rid of all the symptoms I had. Now I feel completely normal. Uh, need to lose some weight. <laughs> There's no question, James, that long term blood pressure being elevated will damage your kidneys. No question mm -hmm. about it. And when you get damaged kidneys, when you get CKD, you're highly likely, almost all of you are going to get high blood pressure. And again, CKD, protein in the urine, be sure to be on an ACE or an ARB, especially if you're getting consistently one plus protein or 200 milligrams. 300 milligrams of albumin per day. Yeah. Now, what? Philip asks, does protein leaking in your urine usually indicate IgA nephrology, nephropathy? Uh, IgA is just one 
of numerous types of glomerular diseases, big word. These are diseases of the kidney that can only be diagnosed by kidney biopsy. And they are not the majority of your folks. The majority of your folks listening are stage three. They do not have any of these glomerular diseases. Most, unusual, that would be a small percentage. If you've got high protein in the urine, your doctor may do a kidney biopsy to figure out which one of these you've got. And now we've got another question. Can you, what is a normal EGFR and creatinine level? Or what's a normal EGFR for someone with one kidney? We get questions a lot about a single mm -hmm. kidney. So <clears throat> the reason why you can donate a kidney to your friend or relative, usually a relative, that you match, tissue matching, is because your other kidney is going to take over and your kidney function will be the same with one or two kidneys. The other kidney will hypertrophy and take over the function of the kidney that's been removed. You only need one kidney. That's why we can donate kidneys. And then Sharon asks, is 116 over 74 a good BP blood pressure for someone with stage four? I would say yes, but be careful, Sharon, that I don't know what your trend is. If you went from 180 to 116, I would worry that your CKD could be related to too low a blood pressure. But if you've been at that 110 to 120 range, perfect, perfect, especially if you've got protein in the urine, it will hopefully slow the rise of creatinine and decline and the decline of EGFR. And someone asks, is a plant diet better than a meat-based diet? Absolutely. Next, next time we're going to get into digging, I think we're going to get into this plant and, and we're going to get into the protein issue. And someone said, people need Dr. Rowe's book. I agree 100%. <laughs> I'm going to start from the bottom up, James. Someone with yeah, yeah, focal, go ahead. focal segmental glomerular cirrhosis FGS um, and assist on the kidney, normal to have one plus when it comes. Anyway, most of the glomerular diseases, that is a big term, right? FSGS, IGA, they have protein in the urine. And the more protein in the urine, no matter what your kidney problem is, the higher your risk of going on dialysis. And the more important it is to at least be on the ACE or off. There's other treatments for these other types of glomerular diseases, which we're not going to get into because they're rare and that's much too complicated. I'm going back to the bottom again. So with stage three blood pressure meds, young patient, again, a young patient stage three. He, <clears throat> okay. This gives me the, the quick uh, discussion of age and your EGFR. <clears throat> um, if you are over 70 and your EGFR is uh, 45 to 60, probably don't have kidney disease. But if you're young and you're 45 to 60, this is a 21 year old, you have kidney disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, 110 to 120 for a young patient is what I would hope they can shoot for. And if there's protein in the urine, for sure, an ACE or an R, okay. Um, and uh, now they're coming in fast and furious. Okay. Some of these yeah. are too complicated. I can't answer them. Uh, Some kidney are pretty shrink, detailed. Kidneys shrink with chronic kidney disease. Your doctor is going to do an ultrasound. It's, it doesn't take any contrast. Uh, and, and one of the signs of, of having kidney disease a long term is your kidneys shrink. And that will help the doctor figure out whether your kidney problem is new, called acute, or you've had it for a long time. Um, and now, uh, now talking about kidney shrink and the ultrasound, is there a reason to get an ultrasound again a few years no. later? No, absolutely. One is fine. And the ultrasounds are basically used uh, as an initial part of the workup. Uh, biopsies uh, for people with a lot of protein in the urine and there's a lot of other testing that your doctor would do before they would uh, recommend getting a kidney biopsy. Um, 
And uh, you got any any others? I don't, I don't want to miss any. any no, I'm short. waiting to hear what you say, and I'm going to search them and pop them up here on the screen. Um, and so I'll just try to CKD five high blood pressure, taking amlodipine, propylol, furosemide. Okay. Now, okay, so Atriva, uh, you're at, uh, first of all, metropolo 25 is a minuscule dose. Uh, the, the highest dose would be 100 twice a day. So you need to maximize those drugs. Furosemide, as I said, is not the best water pill for blood pressure. It would be hydrochlorothiazide or hygrotin. The drugs we mentioned today, like James is on, would be like catapress or cat. Uh, can all clonidine is a good strong drug can lower blood pressure, but you need to be on the right dosing of these drugs. Too many too many patients are on incorrect dosing, uh, and that's why their blood pressure is not coming down. How much is too much potassium? Well, that depends on on what your blood potassium is. If your blood potassium is running over five point five, that could be too much. Uh, but most of you are going to tolerate a plant based high potassium diet which is good for your kidney function and good for your blood pressure. And um, yeah, uh, metoprolol and losartan as far as potassium. Yeah, I mean, both of those drugs, we didn't get into this, but metoprolol can also in some cases raise potassium. Uh, and like I said, uh, the water pill can help counter that. Uh, and if you have the high protein in your urine, uh, you should certainly uh, try to get that potassium under control with the water pill and stay on the ACE or an ARB. Uh, we don't look at total protein in the urine. The main protein we're interested in is albumin, Holly. Uh, and, and the quickest way to get cereal, you know, you can measure it every six to 12 months to see how the protein in your urine is doing or by the dipsticks, which I talk about in my yeah. Urine protein uh, discussion. You can do it yourself at home, but um, you want to get a albumin creatinine ratio. Send it to that's sent to the lab. That gives you an idea of how much albumin is in your twenty-four hour urine without collecting the urine. And we have a link to the uh, protein, the urine protein dipsticks that Dr. Rowe recommends in the description. If anybody wants to get some of those. They're actually extremely affordable, super easy to do at home. Okay, I'm trying to, uh, okay, so someone's GFR was 75, dropped to 51. I, and we go over this and, and I'll do it again tonight. And, uh, and we'll talk about it next time on protein in your diet. These numbers, 76, 76, Anything over 60, the lab should say it's over 60. 76 is not a real number. The drop to 51 has nothing to do with what you're eating. This is uh, just someone. Uh, and, and then I ordered another test, uh, and it was 64. That's all the same number. Your number is around 60. Depending on your age, it would be, it would be stage three. Uh, if you're a younger patient, if you're an older patient, it may be normal for your age especially if there's no protein in the urine. That's one of the commonest situations. I think we're running out of time. <laughs> yeah, and a few shows ago, we talked about, I'm going to bring it up here because I still got it, how it's more than just your EGFR. You got to look at the protein in your urine to figure out kind of where you fall um, for how serious things are, your risk factors. Absolutely, James. And we, we cover that a couple. For those that didn't catch it, we covered that a few uh, videos ago. Is that the one that got all the views? It's yeah, over proteinary. a quarter of a million right yeah. now and growing. Yeah, oh, Protonary. I highly recommend it. It's real important. I hope you folks yeah. will. Well, we yeah. are out of time. Thank you so much, Doc. So informative as always. And I'm going to quickly remind people, Hey, you know someone who has kidney disease and you're thinking, wait, what can I get them for the holidays? Or you want to get yourself a nice gift? Get yourself a copy of Dr. Rowe's book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. In my opinion, and you know, I've read practically every book out there. When I was first diagnosed, I ordered them all. 
and I was reading them and so many of them were just unhelpful or completely wrong. When I read this book, I knew right away I had to get in touch with Dr. Rowe. We had to start working together to share his knowledge and kind of bring some ease to kidney patients by better understanding what matters, what you need to pay attention to. You can get this book at any bookstore. They can order a copy for you, or you can go to the URL, go.dadvicetv.com slash book. Take you right to Amazon where you can get you a copy and have it for the holiday. So thank you all. Now, this is the last scheduled video for the year for 2022, but it's not the last video. You know, I've, I've kind of slowed down these last handful of months because moving, I'm still unpacking. You guys would not believe how many boxes are still piled up here, not even opened yet. And we still have our other house with stuff in it. We still got to move it. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm at the finishing parts of the move. But this weekend, I'm going to do a, a hangout for those that are subscribers and our YouTube members to kind of hang out, chit chat, catch up. And I may do a couple of those before the end of the calendar year. Then Dr. Rowe and I will be back in January. We've got Jen coming back. We've got other people coming back. And I'm going to start in next year in 2023, picking it up again, getting more shows on a regular basis. So thank you so much, Doc. It has been fantastic having you here. As always, I learned something and everyone out there hopefully learned a lot of stuff. Thank you, everyone. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye, everyone.